Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you are in these great United States. We at the Artificial Intelligence Community Practice within the General Services Administration are thrilled to have you join us for our third Applied AI Challenge Industry Day. My name is Ebony J.D. Freeman, and I'm the Communities of Practice Lead within the GSA Centers of Excellence, and I am so excited to meet all 102 of you hear these phenomenal presentations and learn more about the wonderful world of large language models. Before we begin, here are a few reminders to ensure each of us has the best time possible. As I mentioned, this event is being hosted by the Artificial Intelligence Community of Practice, which is a government-wide network of innovators that accelerates the thoughtful adoption of AI in the federal government. If you haven't already joined the AI Community of Practice, please follow the instructions that are gonna be dropped in the Q&A. It, it is open to all government employees and provides cutting edge news, tools, and forums for all things AI. For today's presentations, we'll have a dedicated Q&A at, at the end of each focus area session. These Q&As will be led by the Centers of Excellence, Omar, Saeb, he's the acquisition lead. Please feel free to drop your questions and comments directly in the Q&A, where we will have a member of the AI community of practice team monitoring the Q&A to make sure your questions are answered now or in our follow-up. Additionally, there will be a survey link that will appear during the break. When you exit the event, and also at the end of the event in this browser window. So we're gonna hit you three times with that survey link. Please take some time to provide your comments as it informs how, when, and whether or not we organize more AI challenges in the future. Along the way, you can find the link to closed ca captioning in the chat box. We have a lot of great material today and anticipate that this event will last approximately three hours. Today's event will be recorded, it's already recording, and our team at the General Services Administration will share the recording as soon as possible. Now, to ask questions to the presenters, which we know you're gonna want to, all you need to do is open the Q&A window using the instructions stated on the slide in front of you. So first, you're gonna enter your question in the Q&A box, then click send. Second, if the host or panelist replies via the Q&A, you will see a reply in the Q&A window, pretty helpful. Third, you can click the thumbs up icon to like a question. So if you think it's a really good question, you want to make sure that one, get answers live, got, that one gets answered live, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. Or you can click the red thumbs down icon to unlike the, the red thumbs up icon to unlike the comment. So if you're like, mm, maybe it's not as good of a question as I originally thought. Once you've asked your question, our presenters may answer you via that same Q&A window or they may answer your question live. So you might get a little shout out. The purpose of this AI challenge is to showcase real world use cases of AI to improve the lives of the American people. Today, August 31st, we will have six incredible vendors who will showcase their large language model solutions within four market segments related to climate, equity, economy, and customer experience. We know today's event will connect promising AI technologies with agencies and their AI program offices across the government, thereby increasing AI maturity within and across agencies for the benefit of the American people. Here's a preview of what to expect during today's event. We are currently in the welcome portion, and soon we will hear from our very impressive keynote speakers. We are honored to have Drew Michael Gard, the Deputy Federal Chief Information Officer within the Office of Management and Budget, and Conrad Stowes, the Director of AI for the Office of the Federal Chief Information Officer at the White House, join us today. After our keynotes, we will hear six AI proposals. Hope you're ready for them. The content of the AI presentations are organized by our four focus areas. First, you'll hear from the folks focused on climate. Next, we'll hear from two teams concentrating on equity. Then we'll have a 10 minute break because everybody needs some. When we come back, we will hear proposals focused on the economy and then we'll finish with our last segment on customer experience. 
Finally, we'll wrap up our event with the most important thank yous and some next steps for all of us. Well, before we move on, we would love to hear from you. You're 144 of y'all showed up and we want to hear from you. So we've got our first poll question. Specifically, we're going to be asking which topic area are you most interested in today? Oh, y'all are coming in quick. How are your fingers moving this fast, y'all? Oh my gosh, more than half of y'all have already answered. I just said it two seconds ago. Y'all are so good. Okay, we're gonna close it in just about 10 seconds. So if you haven't answered yet, this is your time. There's 79% of you. Oh, we hit the 80% mark. Woo oh, excellent. So, wow, that, you know, that's a bit surprising. 34% of you are interested in customer experience, but pretty much an even split amongst the other three. Well, I hope you feel that same level of energy for all the categories. Before we go forward, let's take a quick, quick peek backwards into the brief history of the AI challenge. On June 30th, the General Services Administration AI Community of Practice, AICOP, that's what we like to call it, posted this LLM industry day on challenge.gov. We posted this challenge as an invitation for businesses, nonprofits, and academic institutions to submit their AI technologies aimed to improve the, the lives of the American people. In total, we received 88 submissions. That's a pretty good number, y'all, and evaluated them based on four criteria. Clarity, how well does the submission concisely describe the technology? Impact, what is the potential impact of the proposed technology? Mission, how does the submission serve the American people? You're gonna keep hearing that one today, y'all. Feasibility, is the approach described capable of being met? So you and I know that these are the best of the best proposals received. That's what you're gonna hear today. And you know, our esteemed audience members, our hope is that while you are listening, you're also scheming and dreaming about how these technologies could help your agency's mission deliver more effective and efficient government services for the American people. And this work wouldn't be possible without Eric, Michelle, Omar, Ryan, Nate, Danielle, Jenny, and Ed from the GSA Centers of Excellence. And now it is my overwhelming pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker. Again, we're honored to have Drew Michael Gard, the Deputy Federal Chief Information Officer with the Office of Management and Budget. Drew is joined by Conrad Stowes, the Director of AI for the Office of the Federal Chief Information Officer at the White House, uh, Office at the White House to come and share a few words. Drew and Conrad, take it away. Thanks, Ebony. I'm gonna go first and then uh, I'll turn over to Conrad quickly. Um, just wanna thank everybody, you know, like that right before Labor Day and hope that that you all like are, are have some great plans for this week and after this exciting industry day. Um, just wanted to uh, like signing in and looking at this challenge reminded me when I first came into VA um, and out of the military, my first project was to run a um, an app. We were building an app at VA on a, on challenge.gov and how much work the team goes through, like getting these on OM, or getting these on challenge.gov, like answering all the questions, consolidating the, the materials, making the hard decisions and keeping the timeline. So just want to echo Ebony's um, shout out to the team for all, all their hard work and also thanks to the vendor community. Like it was a really good introduction for me and government to see how like the vendor community can really in interact with government in a you know in an atypical way. This was over ten years ago, so this was when it was was a brand new platform, and it's great to see that this has become a part of the way that the federal government charges or um, is able to leverage in in facing challenges and and working on some of our hardest challenges. So at OMB, where Connor and I both work, um, we we review in the IT um, department about $120 billion um, IT federal spend portfolio. So it's very large. We want to make sure that that's well managed, delivering great value and provided and prioritized to things that, that matter to accomplishing the agency's missions and delivering value to our citizens. 
like very specifically, we're charged with stopping federal or stopping foreign intrusions into U.S. agencies, providing expertise in areas like digital identity and AI, redefining security expe expectations for software in the cloud, improving digital experience and driving digital transformation. We partner between like the overall spend of the federal government and our mission areas with our OMB budget colleagues to make sure that the the critical programs that are being run at agencies get funded and IT is, is appropriately budgeted for and properly executed through the time. Specifically in AI, what we've seen in the last couple of years um, through our AI use case inventory and, and just general reaching out to agencies, seen many diverse use cases for AI in the federal government. A number of them you're seeing here today, we've seen it. Um, and then some of the other AI challenges that that the AI Center of Excellence have done. So you've seen improving healthcare, safeguarding the environment, and then protecting our citizens, our nation from cyber threats. Obviously, this is a fast moving area and we need to ensure that the federal government is able to keep up and provide cutting edge services while also managing the risks of AI like bias and discrimination. Specifically in the large language model areas, um, there are some incredible opportunities as, as all of us have seen like since last December and, and probably earlier on um, in the federal government, we really see as an opportunity to innovate and deliver on agency missions. Um, but we do see a very important role uh, with new considerations and risks. So, I, you know, balancing those two is always challenging, but you want to stay excited about the opportunities and aware of the rest. So we're also very energized about this challenge. Um, and I'm Definitely want to see, you know, like the of the 88, unfortunately, six could make, you know, the presentation to industry today. And then I'm looking forward to September. I think it's 15th, mid-September when you guys announce the, the winner of it. As a deputy federal CIO, it's my office role to ensure that we have strong safeguards in place to ensure the accuracy of any AI generated information, especially before we start using LLMs to augment government systems. We also want to empower our federal employees with access to cutting edge tools and ensure they have the ability to experiment and learn, which is why challenges like this are so important. It's also our role in the office of the chief information officer to ensure technology has the adequate safeguards in place so that employees can take advantage of this powerful tech while also adhering to federal information and cyber security policy. As we've updated our policy in the areas of cybersecurity the last couple of years and, and federal information, we've, we also have to consider um, more than just the security of federal information, which is why OMB is releasing further guidance for agencies to ensure their development, procurement, and use of AI centers on, uh, and the use of AI centered on safeguarding the American people's rights and safety. But we are just at the beginning of the journey under the leadership of our director of of AI Conrad. And so I'd like to hear from, turn it over to him and let him um, talk more in depth of, of some of our key um, efforts and, and what progress we're making. Conrad? Thanks, Drew. Uh, yeah, this is a, a great time to be having this challenge. Obviously, um, generative AI and, and LLMs are a bit, uh, have a bit of attention on them right now. Uh, and it's a great time to be hearing from industry on some of the ways that those can specifically be applied to the government. Um, so as Drew talked about briefly, uh, OFCIO, the, our office within OMB, has a statutory responsibility to define and to promote the responsible use of AI and to ensure that agencies have uh, the means to manage the risks associated with uh, that use. So here in, in OMB, we are actually releasing guidance relatively soon on AI uh, and government use of AI. But as the technology is advancing so rapidly, the federal enterprise still has a lot to learn, obviously. So we are really welcoming of opportunities like this for federal agencies to get face-to-face -face with how AI and with generative AI in particular can help their missions. Um, but we're also strong believers in safeguards and managing AI risks. Uh, this is helpful for that too, right? We, we definitely see the need for federal agencies to get hands-on to the technology, to learn about it, uh, to familiarize themselves and experiment in order to be able to both use it, but also to manage its risks effectively. Um, so uh, to share some of the, the knowledge that agencies are doing both in, in avenues like this and, and their own experimentation, we're 
actively working with agencies to inventory their AI use cases, collect those, um, share them between agencies, provide some sort of connective tissue across the many activities across government. Um, and we're also committed to building and growing government AI expertise and awareness uh, among the federal workforce. And one of the things I just want to briefly highlight is that we've been partnering with GSA's AI community of practice and with faculty from Stanford University to pilot a new AI training for the federal workforce. Uh, and that's happening soon in the near future, and we're really looking forward to it, and it should be open to, uh, to, to most government folks. Um, so it's critical, you know, uh, to provide the federal workforce with opportunities to gain and increase their AI knowledge. And during this training, employees will get a chance to hear perspectives from Stanford professors. It's not necessarily going to be a, a authoritative training on everything you need to know about AI. You can't fit that into a short training, unfortunately, but uh, get to hear a lot of uh, input and perspectives from leading professors on the science behind AI, managing the risks of AI and ways in which AI can benefit the federal government. So if you're interested in that, in addition to the things we're gonna learn today, uh, I recommend and encourage folks to, to check out GSA's AI Community of Practice page, which has opportunities to um, register as a follow-up to this uh, great presentation today. So uh, I'll wrap it up there and just say, greatly appreciate the opportunity to be with you all uh, and to hear from the great finalists and learn more about the ways that AI can be used to further drive uh, some of the, the priorities of the government. So thanks. Thank you, Drew and Conrad, for your encouraging words and support. I see we have a question for y'all in the Q&A. We'll make sure to get it over to you after the event so you can answer. Also, thank you for pumping up the Stanford High event. We thank you for that little throw in there. Without further ado, I hope you're ready for our first category. Up first, we have an AI submission that helps address the climate crisis. Welcome to the stage, Nexepta. Hello everyone, this is Kemal Davasol from Nexepta. I am, can you hear my voice okay? Okay, great. Um, I'm not seeing the share screen yet. Oh, now I can see it, perfect. Sounds good. Okay. Okay, here we go. This is our presentation. Uh, it's, a, it's a very nice, uh, it's a great experience to be here. Thank you very much for uh, for inviting us uh, or selecting us. Uh, let me put down the hide. Okay, so um, today, uh, my name is Kemal Davasolo. I'm a principal scientist at Nexepta. Today, I'll be presenting our solution called Climate Science. Um, we built Climate Science as a large language model uh, solution to address uh, climate crisis and enhance public awareness. Um, Nexepta is a small business that is based in Gettysburg, Maryland, and we have a lot of efforts in developing novel AI ML technologies, uh, mainly focusing on NLP, uh, computer vision, and time series data. So with that, here we go. Okay, so um, as a motivation, um, climate crisis is a our global problem with vital effects on American people as well as anybody on the world. Uh, I'm sure that most of you have seen the images of devastation that the wildfires have caused in, in, in Lahaina, Maui. And that was just in August. If you go back a few months, you can see the climate change has amplified India's monsoon season with catastrophic outcomes. In, in June, India experienced major floods in the um, in the Himachal Pradesh region. And another extreme event that we have seen this year, starting in February, was the longest lived storm ever recorded on the world, uh, in the world. And there is Cyclone Freddy. Um, uh, more than 400 people have been killed and thousands of homes were destroyed. That cyclone traveled 5,500 miles uh, uh, path, a path of uh, 5,500 miles uh, within a span of 36 days. Um, and with, with the extreme events that we have seen, the, the extreme events that we have seen this year is not limited to these three examples. For example, the wildfires in Canada affected the air pollution in the East Coast. Um, as you can see, all these extreme events are a global problem 
uh, although it might be happening in another country or in another region. So with the climate crisis, we are going to see the scale, duration, uh, frequency, and impact of these extreme events uh, substantially increasing. So unfortunately, some of the um, Unfortunately, some of the human activities contribute to significant destruction, degradation and fragmentation of the nature around us, in our communities, in our states, or even in our countries. Um, for example, activities such as draining untreated sewage to ocean, unplanned coastal development, trawling, overfishing, and deforestation can have direct or indirect results on soil erosion, raising sea levels, biodiversity loss, species loss, coral bleaching and mangrove depletion. So why did we build climate science? Our goal is to increase awareness and align potential solutions with local and federal uh, policymakers, organizations, researchers, educators, and individuals, and the public in general. Um, however, there are many challenges in connecting uh, these, two, these, these uh, potential solutions with the policymakers and local communities. For example, as an interesting fact, today, an average American consumes about the equivalent of 30, 34 gigabytes of data and information every day. So the scale of information that one needs to sift through in order to reach the right information source is very large. Another challenge is that the information resource that you are looking for could be in another language or could be coming from another geographical location to you that you may not be following that data stream. Right? Another challenge is that information, uh, that information that you are looking for can be a local news that is not advertised on the national outcomes, but it will provide as a, as a solution uh, to, your, uh, to your problem. So we have built Climate Sense as a large language model, a solution to understand, analyze, and organize volumes of climate related data rapidly and accurately and deliver valuable insights with actionable knowledge. In climate science, we have a LLM-based information retrieval solution. Uh, we can provide personalized recommendations and we build a conversational NIP capability. We analyze more than uh, 140 countries, um, resources, more than uh, resources coming from 141 countries spanning more than 40 languages and 60,000 resources. Our, our platform uses multiple large language models for information retrieval, uh, for information retrieval to select a set of resources from a large collection of data, summarize a selected document, text, article, government report, uh, patents, and so on, and provide, uh, uh, and provide semantically a semantic related keywords to you that you can expand your research on. And conversation and RP capability that you can interact with the article, with the text, with the report, with the document that you are reading. So why do we use a large language model? Large language models are very good in transforming text into some numeric representation uh, so that we can do the uh, AI ML applications that, uh, that, you can, uh, that we, we know how to use. But large language models are actually uh, much more beyond that. Uh, large, large, they, uh, large language models are large and complex models that, have, that can understand uh, the context, uh, the natural language. Uh, they have very good natural language understanding capabilities. Um, that context awareness uh, enables the LLMs to generate coherent and contextually relevant text, making them suitable for texts like content generation and natural language understanding. For example, you can use an LLM to classify a given document or a paragraph or an article, search within a document, extract uh, named entities, rewrite a given document or a text, um, cluster uh, multiple documents or summarize a given document. Right? Um, in our system, we are using a large language model that is trained over 50 different languages uh, with multiple data sets. And the advantage of using a multilingual LLM model is to leverage knowledge and patterns that the model can learn, um, uh, uh, patterns that the model can learn from one language and improve its performance in another language. 
This enables the model to generalize its, generalize its uh, understanding across languages and potentially even for the languages that we didn't train on. Uh, it wasn't explicitly trained on. Um, in developing these models, we have followed ethical and responsible AI principles and practices in building and fine tuning our ALM uh, model. So, um, so what does climate sense do? How does it work? The multilingual large language model can sift through, uh, sift, sift through the large uh, quantities of resources. Those could be online or databases that we have already curated and selects the semantically relevant ones. We can apply advanced text analytics uh, to tailor the content to user needs and provide climate crisis information and potential solutions. If you enable, uh, the, the, if you enable uh, the, the climate science platform can send you notifications when it discovers a new um, uh, and a relevant resource, uh, is, when a, a new and a relevant resource is discovered. So what are the expected benefits of climate science? One of the major uh, benefits of climate science is to promote sustainable practices through extraction and dissemination of relevant climate crisis information um, to different languages, to different demographics. And those could even include things like uh, climate risk aware investment strategies. The second goal is to raise awareness about the climate crisis and identify indicators of climate change around you, or in your neighborhood, in your state, or even in your country. All these benefits will provide time and cost effectiveness. So let's take a look at our platform. This is our login page. After a quick registration, you can log into uh, to your account through your email and password, uh, which will then take you to our uh, homepage. This is the dashboard. Um, in the homepage, you will see that we, we have created, curated uh, um, uh, several climate related collections for you to browse as an initial step. Uh, you can click them here or you can click them on the left side under topics. If you want to remove them, you can remove or you can add a new topic that you want to follow. We also have a query box uh, where you can ask a question, apply any filters for language, time, geography. And this query could be in, in any of the 40 languages that our uh, LLM model uh, uses. If there is any resource that you like, you can add them to your favorites. Uh, and if there is a resource that you want to go back uh, um, to read uh, that you have read in our platform, you can uh, uh, you can see that through the history uh, uh, through the history on the left pane. Um, if you click if you click on any of these topics, um, which will take you to this page. For example, this is about a flood protection. Um, uh, this is a collection of recent articles in the topic of flood protection and flood protection strategies. Um, in our platform, if you ask a question on the query box, for example, if you say, can you find wildfire mitigation strategies? These are the collection of articles that are provided as of August 28th. And you can click on any of these resources, which will then take you to this page. On this page, you can see that the article's title, article source, the image from the source, a summary that we provide using our LLM model, a word cloud using another LLM model. If you like the article, you can click on uh, on the, tit the, the, the title, which will then take you to the outside source. In this case, it is the globalvillagespace.com. Uh, right? um, uh, in the system, you can act, interact with the article. You can ask a question about this article and say that, can you summarize this text with action items to mitigate climate crisis? The LLM will read through the article and then respond to you with, whatever, with, the, with the action items it sees on the text. For example, it can say action items to mitigate climate crisis and respond to wildfire, wildfires in an area is emergency response and evacuation plan prioritizing which, which uh, uh, residents to uh, rescue first, establishing emergency shelters and coordinating transportation and so on. So these are the texts that is contained in the article. So um, let's take a, let's do a demo and let's take a look at our, uh, our capabilities. 
Right. So this is our um, this is our landing page. This is our uh, login page. You can enter for the sake of uh, time. I'll just move forward. Right. So uh, these are our home favorites and history. These are the topics that we have curated as an initial step. Um, you can ask your queries and do your filters here. If you want to focus on in any of these, you just want to see the our news articles or academic studies or government resources, you can click on those. And if you search for the flood protection, you can actually see the articles here. And for the forest fires, these are this is the collection of items. If you click on any of these, you go to another page called uh, another page for that article. It is a summary that you provide an image from this article, and you can click and go to that outsource outside source if you want to uh, if you want to read it into the system uh, into our LLM model uh, conversation and lab capability if you ask and say that please summarize this text with action items to mitigate climate crisis climate crisis right click on the query and the query will return you you know the with the action items to do in the case of a fire and why you need to do as a proactively uh, to mitigate its effects on the on the population around it. Let's test another example. For example, if you say, um, if you say, can you find wildfire mitigation strategies? You can select any of the language, do a filter, and say query, which will then take you to another one, right? And if you click on the if you click on any of the text. This is a text about, uh, this is an article that was published in USA Today about the, 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 the um, vulnerability of other places in the United States uh, against wildfires. Um, it's, the, it's called The Next Mile Could Be Anywhere. Uh, and it has a lot of good resources in this article. So if you ask a question to the system saying that, what are the lessons learned in this article? It will uh, show you the query results with what uh, with uh, with the results that are contained in this article. So, uh, who are the end users of climate science? We have identified three categories of uh, end users, in all the way from individuals to local communities to international decision makers. For example, this is a miracle house that was in Lahaina uh, that was recently restored, and while the the whole neighborhood was destroyed, it actually suffered very minor uh, damages. It, it was um, a fire uh, hardened, and that will constitute as a that can constitute as a very good model in rebuilding Lahaina. Um, to the local communities, as an example, is the Tucson and Arizona, where the community worked together to restore the native vegetation to improve their drought resilience. In the statewide or in, na in national or international case, um, one good example is restoring the coastal habitat. There is a blue carbon national action plan in the United States. It is an international case for the, from the World Economic Forum that constitutes a very good role for the international you know, or the state-wise or the national decision makers where they can use our platform uh, to reach information and they can even use it for addressing geopolitical issues. So our goal was to improve public awareness and share sustainable practices in real time using large language models. Um, uh, we hope that you enjoyed our presentation. And if you have any questions, you can send us an email at climatesense at nixepte.com. Uh, and I would like to thank you uh, for, for, for the opportunity to present our work. Thank you. Wow, how intriguing. Thank you so much. Now I'll pass the virtual mic to Omar to lead the climate Q&A. Thank you, Ebony. I appreciate it. Uh, just a couple quick reminders. Uh, please use the Q&A function for uh, for any of your questions and not the chat function. Also, we're going to we're kind of kind of do about 10 minutes, about eight, eight minutes for questions for any Q&A that comes through. Also, please indicate who's the, who the question is for the name or obviously the particular company. And if you can repeat the question and read the question out loud, that would be great for the actual uh, for the actual presenter. Uh, I'll actually I'll actually address the first one from uh, from James. So this is for Kamal. In your knowledge base, you appear to be storing uh, the full body of news articles. How do you how do you deal with sources that prohibit data scraping? For example, New York Times. 
Um, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, some of them do prohibit it, and some of them do not, although there's a paywall. Um, but if there's a paywall, uh, since we are not showing the text itself, uh, we are not constrained by the loyalties to them. And also we are not, uh, we are just summarizing the context to them. Right? If there is a limited information that we can scroll through, for example, in New York Times, we will only be showing you the, uh, whatever is available uh, through, getting that, uh, through getting that article. Um, that is a little bit about the loyalties and uh, the cases that they have. But as we grow this knowledge and we can uh, pay them, then we can expand our resources. So right now we are co covering already 60,000 resources. As we get more funding, we can actually get subscribed to them and expand our expand our uh, coverage on the ones that are behind paywalls. Uh, so I hope that answers that question. Uh, right now we are taking whatever is available, which is usually the first two paragraphs. But if there is, um, as we get more funding, we can actually get subscription and expand our knowledge database as well. Thank Great. you for the question. Yeah, we appreciate it. Uh, you got also another question. Uh, one, how does how does your product improve upon other commonly available ways to get information? Example, and then one, one more one other ones. How do you qualify? How do you how do you how do you quality control data in so many languages? Okay, uh, the two great questions actually. Um, 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 so um, one of them, the the first question was. Uh, can you repeat the first question again? Sorry. I yeah, no, no problem. Uh, how, how does your product improve upon otherly, other common, commonly available ways to get information? Definitely. So for example, take, take Google, uh, right? Uh, we are not competing. We don't want to compete with Google itself, right? But if you write a complex query on the Google search, um, uh, they actually struggle in right, uh, doing the complex searches, right? For example, uh, they, have they have released a new, I'm sure, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe some of you have seen the genetic AI capabilities that is in the trial mode in Google, right? For example, we, we just made a test that if you search for uh, what is climate crisis on Google, it actually does a genetic AI on the backend and it provides a good answer to you. But if you say, what would be a good LLM application to mitigate climate crisis, it actually falls back to the old case, uh, to the old search, and it doesn't provide you um, good solutions, right? In our case, we are doing the LLM, uh, since we are using a large language model to understand the similarities between the query and the data sources out there, it's actually a very good way of understanding semantically similar things. Semantic similarity is very critical because although you may not use the same word, it's they are actually in that embedding space where are very close to their synonyms so that you can capture a lot of words uh, and understand their semantic similarity much better than uh, keyword searches, right? So the keyword search or the page rank type of search capabilities are actually a little bit outdated in the sense that they don't capture the semantic uh, quality, semantic capability that we are looking for, right? Um, because page rank is more about how the websites are connected to each other, irrespective of the, in most cases of the text itself, right? Whereas the keyword is more about how often that keyword comes up in that article. But if you are searching for something, there's a synonym, then it will be actually a zero, right? So that's why LLMs opened up a new world to us that we can do uh, semantic search, which we didn't have before uh, in most of the prior technologies. For data quality, it is all about, in my opinion, the data sources that you select. For example, in our AI model, uh, we are actually selecting uh, we are actually selecting the models as an initial case that are trained on vetted data sets. If your AI model has been trained on unvetted data sets like forums or some discussion areas, right? They are actually unfiltered. They might have biases. They might, they might have toxic content which we want to avoid anyway. Therefore, if you train your AI algorithm on a data set that has been vetted, that you know it has been clean, um, and it doesn't have you know, bias, toxic elements, uh, you know, the bad words and so on, it's actually a very good way of uh, understanding the quality uh, that, that your AI model is trained on. Right? So this is about training your AI. If you train it on with bias, with toxic uh, you know, text, you will have subsequent effects in that, right? It's just like your child, if they watch some bad content on the TV, 
they will be seeing those bad contents in the real life. Same for your AI model, it will have the same, you know, unfortunately, capabilities. So that's for training the AI model with the data that we are using. The data that we are showing is actually about the, you know, the, the news articles that they are doing. So if there's any bias based on that news articles, uh, political, you know, situation, we don't have much control uh, on that one. So that's the only thing about the data quality that, you know, this is an online resource, but we are not only limited to the news articles, we are actually also looking at the government reports, which are very critical for other, uh, you know, communities uh, that they can know what the government is planning to do. So they can do, you know, parallel actions so that they can mitigate, the, take actions to mitigate climate crisis or the effects on them. Um, I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Kamal. Uh, one, we got a couple more questions as well. Uh, we have, so multi, multilingual language models may have varying performance depending on the language, in particular for low resource languages. Did you That's assess right. performance of cult climate sense for different languages? Did you notice difference, differences in, in the relevance of results to queries or in the quality of summary for different languages? That, that's actually an excellent question as well. Um, that is true. Um, but it's also true that if you have a single model just for one, uh, one language, um, so there were like uh, some interesting like uh, natural language processing uh, workshops where they opened up some challenges. And um, in those challenges, the ones that always performed the best or the, in the top uh, certain numbers were the ones that were trained across different languages, right? So uh, the large language models are very good, uh, very good, right? Uh, in, 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 in their performance, uh, in their performance. So uh, in low resources, it is true that their performance is not that good, uh, but since we are using large language models, if they have a relative language in, in our training database, it's actually a very good way of expanding or understanding sort of like the similarities. So we can, we can uh, just like I mentioned in one of the slides, uh, since we know the patterns in that language, in the, in this, let's say cousin language, we can actually carry that one into the low resource language as well. So that's a very good uh, case, but since a multilingual uh, model, this chain of 50 uh, different languages, uh, if it's cousin, if it's a relative uh, language is within our training data, it is actually a very good way of um, uh, improving our performance or um, capturing the semantic similarity there. But a very good question. All right, what, one, more, one more question. How is the data updated? Is, it, is the internet queried on the fly based on user query or is there time-based crawls with database updated in a batch? Do you have a process for evaluating differing information on the same topic? Uh, that's true. That's, that's, that's a very good question. That's why in, in our presentation, we said we are doing both of them at the same, we are doing, uh, so we do uh, continuously periodically update our system. But if there's a new query that said that the time has passed since our query, we do a new query and we get it until the, care, the, care, the place where it is not updated in our system, right? So that's a very good way of getting online resources as well as the ones that we have already cached in our system. That brings us cap uh, advantage for latency, right? So when the user clicks on the query, we wanna make sure that the information is given to them as soon as possible. Like nobody will wait for another minute. So by pre-caching and also uh, pre-caching through our database and also getting the new data uh, with certain intervals, we can actually present it to the users with the minimal latency as possible. Thank you so much, Carl. I'm gonna hand over to Ebony. Thank you, Omar, and thank you, NextSepta team. Thank um, you very much. have two submissions focused on equity for all Americans. Take it away, Osni AI. Hi, thank you. Let me get my slides up. Okay. That was a very interesting presentation. Uh, I am Nathan Harmon from Osni AI, and I'm excited to present Jibber Jabber. Uh, Jibber Jabber is a large language, large language model based command and control for radio frequencies uh, that enables humanitarian efforts. As we were just hearing about, uh, there's a lot of natural disasters occurring in our world, and 
um, whether it's uh, the Maui fires um, that have been extremely uh, deadly, maybe uh, the most deadly fire in over a century in the US. We still have uh, people missing. Um, and the impacts of these natural disasters are often accentuated by the rapidly changing conditions and the difficulty with communication and the resulting failures in communication. RF provides a invisible backbone that's relied upon by emergency response teams. It is a huge amount of information that exists in the spectrum uh, that we only um, partially utilize. Um, the parts that we do utilize, we are very dependent on, whether it's two-way radios, blue force trackers, emergency alert systems, uh, satellite phones. And when these systems fail or we don't utilize them to their full extent, uh, we do not um, uh, respond as we should to these events. Um, beyond just the data that exists from the response teams, there's also a lot of information being exchanged on the civilian side. Uh, from walkie-talkies or new news broadcasts over the FM and radio, uh, AM radio stations, or cell phones and smart watches. Uh, when you can utilize all of this information, uh, it really enhances your ability to respond to these situations. Um, but oftentimes, due to the sheer complexity and the knowledge requirements to utilize it properly, uh, we fail to do that. Uh, some of these complexities just come from uh, knowing where and frequencies these devices exist or their access strategies or encoding. Um, and this puts a huge burden on human operators, both in the amount of training they require to get into this field, as well as just when you're in the field operating, you have all this extra complexity that takes away from your response mission. This is what we've built Jibber Jabber to solve. Um, Jibber Jabber removes a lot of this uh, cognitive burden off operators. So rather than um, having to know the exact frequency, data access type, device type, when you need to go collect some data, you can now just say uh, something like the prompt that's shown on the right here, is anyone requesting help on a walkie-talkie? Uh, from there, uh, Jibber Jabber will leverage a large language model in order to uh, autonomously go and find the correct frequencies, access strategies uh, for achieving this uh, objective that the users provided. And then we also have developed a, a radio stack uh, that can drive a software to find radio. So then the large language model uh, is capable of then operating this radio stack to go collect this data. Uh, the data is then uh, demodulated into audio. This audio is then translated into the language that the operator speaks and then transcribed back into text. Uh, and then that allows the large language model to then uh, query this as we were just seeing. Um, so then you can ask questions about these streams of data, um, such as, is anyone requesting help? Uh, if we just once again think about an emergency response situation, uh, you might have one team that uh, has had some conditions change and now their evacuation route has become unsafe, um, while another team has successfully established a safe zone. This information needs to be quickly communicated to the correct parties, um, and a system like Jibber Jabber can do this all automatically. It can listen to the conversations that are happening, understand the context that's happening, and facilitate this communication. Uh, this next slide, we're going to look at a video recording of actually running the Jibber Jabber system. This is using uh, real hardware and real over-the-air data, um, no simulation, it's all, all live. It uh, was live when we recorded the video. Um, so given that we're using large language models in order to, um, in order to uh, drive this system, they also understand the parameters of the system that they're running. So they can train a user how to operate them. So you can just ask questions like, you know, what, what are your capabilities? Um, or even questions that are RF related to uh, increase your education level on these things. You know, what is 
an FM signal? How is that modulated? Uh, what types of data are commonly held there? Beyond the training aspect, you can also now just ask it to accomplish tasks. So a simple one, collect FM radio, and then it'll tell you how it thinks it's going to achieve that, um, and then give you the actual parameters that it's setting the radio to. And now you can see this live spectrogram um, showing all these channels of FM radio stations. So each of those lines is a different FM radio station. Um, and that uh, ends up being a lot of data. So you can see as it starts collecting and demodulating all these streams, you end up getting a lot of text, a lot of information, um, far beyond what one human could really comprehend at a single time. Um, once all of this data is transcribed, you can then go and select one of these transcripts and start interrogating it, um, whether it's just asking for a summary. So this was a BBC News uh, channel. And so by asking for a summary of it, um, you end up getting a summary of the news from that day. Um, or you can ask if specific topics are being discussed, such as, you know, is somebody requesting help over this RF channel? Um, beyond just a simple command, um, you can ask it to do more semantically rich uh, tasks. So look for a hiker. That doesn't specifically tell it what to do in the RF domain, but it's intelligent enough to realize that, well, hikers might have uh, walkie-talkies on them. And so then it goes and tunes the, the radio stack into the walkie-talkie band. Um, there was not um, a lot going on in the walkie-talkie band in the lab, so we just uh, said some stuff over a walkie-talkie. I'm afraid the background's getting blurred out. Um, and then the system will pick that up and uh, transcribe that text as well. There it goes. And so then that uh, was what I said on the walkie-talkie. Um, uh, in the lab. So the capabilities that we just saw there were this built-in training mechanism. So um, it's, it's uh, very important to be able to train your operators and this uh, system will let their operators um, just ask questions as they go in their own words um, and then provide feedback um, as far as questions relating to the RF domain. It's also a capable of uh, accomplishing objectives autonomously. So you can provide it with this objective for listening, looking for missing persons, and it will go ahead and do intelligent things using the spectrum um, to try to locate those, such as looking for walkie-talkies. The radio stack is capable of detecting, identifying, and demodulating AM and FM signals. Our translation and transcription uh, currently works in 57 languages, and we're looking to increase that. Um, we can, and then finally, extract insight from that collected data, such as looking for people requesting for help. The system is a microservice architecture, so if you already have a collection platform, such as your, your, own, your own radio, um, we currently support the Vita 9 format for serialization, so you can just plug your radio in, and our system will run, um, but you can plug in at any of these levels. So if you have a radio and your own uh, radio stack as far as processing these signals, then you can just plug into our natural language processing. As far as where we're headed, uh, we have uh, really been working a lot on these first two things with the continuous feedback into the LLM. So you ask it to do a task like look for a missing hiker and likely the first thing it'll choose to do is go look for a walkie-talkie, but maybe the hiker didn't bring a walkie-talkie with them. And so it's gonna try to collect data for a while. It's not gonna find anything. And then it's going to go ahead and move on and start looking for other RF emissions. Maybe there's some Bluetooth coming off a smartwatch or some sort of signal coming off of a cell phone. Um, and so it can continue to uh, take in what it's collected and change its behavior to attempt to accomplish the objective. And then we've also been testing running on um, an NVIDIA Orin. It's a small embedded platform. It's 
you know, a four, four inch cube basically. Um, and this has required, you know, fine tuning smaller uh, language models um, that are very task specific that are capable of fitting on this harder, uh, smaller hardware footprint. So that's the uh, jibber jabber system. And if you have interest in this, we'd love to hear from you. Um, you can contact me over email and please check out our uh, website and blog. Wow, how interesting. Thank yeah. you. Now we'll hear from figure eight. Don't you just love a Zoom snafu, y'all? Just love them. Hi, everyone. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Hi everyone, my name is Tim. I'm the head of product here at Figure 8 Federal. And today I wanna to present our solution for an LLM-based chatbot focused on driving equitable access to tax and regulatory information. Every American deserves an equal chance to get ahead. And a big part of that is breaking down the financial and other equity-related barriers related to access to key information and getting answers to questions that allow individuals to innovate quickly and chase their dreams. Before I get started, I wanna take a second to talk about who we are and why we're passionate about this topic. Figure Eight Federal's primary investor is Appen, the leading data enrichment company for AI technologies. Figure Eight Federal, we are a small team, Folkai mitigated from Appen with a sole mission of empowering federal employees with technology solutions that enable them to drive impact to the American people. And to date, we've had early success with both our parent company's commercial clients, as well as federal agencies, where we focus on making data visible, accessible, understandable, and trustworthy for LLM initiatives. So I know what you're likely thinking, who cares about tax and regulatory information? This is a boring topic and what does it have to do with equity? And what I'd like to tell you is a quick story and that shows why we care about this topic and, and why we're passionate about solving some of the pain points related to this. So years ago as a, a broke engineering college student, I had a dream of leveraging technology to connect urban and rural communities with access to non-GMO plants and natural garden products. And the biggest challenge I faced was understanding the tax and regulatory information associated with starting and running a small business. I remember staying on hold with the IRS for over three hours trying to get answers to my questions. And some of my more wealthier classmates would recommend, oh, hire a law firm or an accountant to explain stuff. But at the time that was beyond the, my means. And as a result, I ended up having to spend a lot of time researching tax and regulatory information associated to the space that I was operating that small business in. My girlfriend is from Brazil. Recently, her and some of her Brazilian friends wanted to start a business in the US. And actually tax and regulatory codes are very different in the US than they are in Brazil. And as an immigrant, she is facing an increased challenge from an equity perspective, gaining access to the information that she needs. And so hearing about my girlfriend and, and her struggles and her friend's struggles reminded me of those days in my college days and the struggle I even had to find access to tax and regulatory information, uh, even as somebody who grew up here in the D.C. area. And so it got me asking, what if there was a way to leverage LLMs to create a chatbot experience that could provide customized insights to complicated tax and regulatory information, regardless of your financial status, where you're from, or what you're trying to achieve. 
What if there was a way to empower government agencies to have full control to easily modify LLMs to check and mitigate for things like bias or hallucinations and keep legal information up to date in that chatbot itself? So at Figure 8 Federal, we believe that an LLM chatbot is the answer to providing equitable access to customized insights on tax and regulatory information. It will not only reduce the heavy demand on agencies like IRS and others with regards to phone support, but it will also solve a lot of the traditional issues with chatbots not being able to provide helpful enough information. The key issue though, with using an LLM for providing insights on things like tax and regulatory information is on finding an adaptive approach that empowers government employees to continuously monitor and improve the LLM to evaluate it for safety, reliability, and accuracy, and identify and mitigate bias in real time. So at Figure 8 Federal, we have experience developing a number of training data for, for major uh, foundational LLMs on the market today, as well as customizing these LLMs for various enterprise applications through things like fine tuning and reinforcement learning with human feedback. And when customizing an LLM, there are a lot of things under the hood that are required to optimize them for a niche use case and really to identify and mitigate the potential biasness that could be in your original training data that was used to develop that LLM to ensure you're providing not only equitable access to information, but providing accurate information as well. So we've developed a platform uh, called the Figure 8 Federal LLM Optimization Platform that empowers agencies to ingest tax and regulatory information, connect to foundational LLMs, and then develop, test, and validate fine-tuning data to reduce bias and hallucinations and ensure information is provided in a way that provides fair access to critical information that can help small businesses get off the ground. So our system also provides a front-end chatbot interface that agencies can deploy and share with end clients. And so instead of a static approach, taking a one-time customization of an LLM for a particular purpose, in this case, tax and regulatory information, what we've done is created an end-to-end -end solution that provides full government oversight through integration of government subject matter experts, continual monitoring, full transparency, and integrated red teaming to ensure that there are checks in place to evaluate for things like accuracy, reliability, and effectiveness for all users across all demographics and backgrounds. So in the front end, we've designed a simple interface that allows users to upload information about their, in, their business and to provide the LLM with context for supporting them with uh, chats on questions related to tax and regulatory information customized to their small business. It contains simple to use buttons for things like to indicate that the response is too complicated, ask for an example, or to clarify for exceptions. The front end chat interface provides a feedback loop to the Figure 8 Federal LLM optimization platform on the back end that can escalate chats that are needed to provide additional insights and clarification from human support teams. So if we go back to the overall picture of the platform, what we have is a number of modules that provide things like the structuring of raw data from things like existing IRS web pages, tax laws, and other agency provided data leveraging our workflow engine, quality control modules, and then the integrated red, red teaming, we provide a tool set for identifying and mitigating bias and ensuring that inaccurate answers are flagged and sufficient training data is developed to optimize the LLM to perform its uh, additional improvements over time. And so one of the key differentiators here is actually our smart tasking module, which allows government employees to test and evaluate the optimization of this tech, the text uh, of the chatbot by connecting it to a wide range of end user groups. And so uh, government employees have access to a diverse crowd through our parent company app and directly within the platform that allows them to rapidly assemble diverse user groups where they can reward individuals that provide feedback on testing the quality and effectiveness of this tax and regulation chatbot in answering their need. And this is key in really being able to identify bias before deploying it to a broader public audience. 
And so just wanted to highlight a couple of the modules on the back end that help make this a reality. Uh, we have a, a no-code, low-code interface that we developed uh, where government employees can have uh, full customizability of developing the fine-tuning data to optimize those LLMs uh, that feed into the, the chatbot interface. And we have a workflow module. And what, what is really key about the workflow module is it allows government employees to be able to automatically route information that is connected to that front-end chatbot so that they can integrate red, red teaming and quality flow technology to be able to identify issues and mitigate those issues quickly and effectively. So just a highlight of the quality control module, this module actually monitors over 200 different human factors to ensure the quality of the fine tuning data sets when an issue arises with the chatbot where additional insights and information needs to be provided to fine tune uh, the chatbot for additional information and context related to some new tax or regulation uh, related to a small business. And basically, the overall approach of combining these elements in the background behind the chatbot is really to focus on enabling an agency to deploy a chatbot for something like very complicated, like tax and uh, regulatory information. But instead of having the static one-time approach, empowering the government employees to be able to quickly adapt and continuously monitor and flag for where certain users aren't able to get access to the type of information that, that they are seeking through the chatbot. And so that, that's why we developed this as more of a comprehensive solution of not only just the LLM interface and, and way for people to interact with this, this chatbot, but also the backend process for government agencies to have the ability to have more of a government guided approach to ensure that they are taking the needs of all different users that are interacting with the chatbot to gain relevant information related to tax and regulatory uh, insights for their particular business, but providing that oversight and integration to adapt that as, as changes to the tax and regulatory codes uh, develop over time. And so we see our, our tool as a way to uh, not just be a, a one-time caught solution, but to be something that is uh, allows an integrated teaming approach, uh, empowering uh, folks within the government to fully customize and adapt um, the chatbot's interface and also rapidly test with those user groups, leveraging our, our global crowd for individuals from different countries that may be immigrating here and want to find certain information, being able to test across you know, different industries for small businesses that are focused on, on you know, manufacturing or maybe they're focused on service type businesses allows the IRS or other agencies to really be able to take a driver's seat perspective in uh, monitoring and ensuring that a chatbot that they provide to the public is fully adaptable and customizable um, and can solve potential issues that arise that could be leading to, to bias or an inequitable approach with how individuals are trying to get access uh, to tax and regulatory information. And I want to thank you guys for uh, inviting us for this presentation, and I look forward to your questions. Wow, now I'll pass the mic to Omar to lead the equity Q&A. Thank you, Ebony, I appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna kind of go for the first particular question that came up. Uh, this is for uh, for Jibber Jabber, right? This is gonna be for Jibber Jabber as well as... Uh, is, is there a particular reason uh, you chose to showcase a live video versus a live demo? Yeah, the, the main reason is, you know, you want it to go perfectly during the presentation. Um, but also, you know, we can only collect data as fast as it's transmitted. So if you want to, you know, summarize a bunch of news, then you'd have to wait, you know, for the whole news broadcast to go. So you collected it all. Okay, great. Um, 
Next question is for Jibber Jabber. How large of an audio buffer, temporally speaking, is there per source? What are the storage demands and how does that scale in signal rich environments? Yeah, um, hopefully I parsed this question correctly. Um, so the audio buffer can be up to 30 seconds if you are performing translation um, because you can't uh, perform good translation if you don't have enough context. Um, but if you are just transcribing directly into the same language that uh, it was originally spoken in, then you can reduce that down to a sub-second. Um, as far as storage demands, it just depends on how much do you want to keep around. Um, but at that point, it's text, so it's very small, so you don't need a lot of storage. Great. Uh, this also this question is for Jibber Jabber. What size of training, what, what size of training data set do you have for various situations, like a lost hiker? This product is super cool, but it seems like there, there would be a lot, lots of edge cases in relatively small universe of events. Of course, this assumption may be wrong. How does your platform handle those edge cases? Yeah. Um, so we do employ something called a grammar that's a enforcement on the output of the large language model that guarantees that your outputs will be in the parameters of the hardware. Um, for example, the software-defined radio we're using can only sample up to 20 megahertz of bandwidth. And so if the a large language model tried to produce a scan plan that required more than that, it would fail. We also use something called um, tree of thought prompting that allows you to produce multiple approaches to the solution and then create scores across them and use the most probable one to succeed. And then finally, uh, we've been using uh, the large language models, model self-alignment where you take these larger large language models and produce a bunch of training data to then align your smaller um, model to these more obscure use cases. Great. Uh, another question for Jibber Jabber. Can this be scaled up to monitor the majority of known spectrum simultaneously instead of having to tune in? I can imagine that this technology can listen, listen on a wide range of frequencies for people in distress and send out notifications to emergency centers and responders. Sure. Uh, so you do need some sort of locality with your receiver, like, you know, the receiver in the lab is not going to be able to receive signals that are um, occluded, you know, if there's a big hill in between me and where the hiker is. Um, so, and then there's also processing demand. So if you're deploying on the edge, there's going to be a limited bandwidth that you can realistically achieve, and then you have to employ some sort of tuning. Um, but if you have server-grade hardware and you can scale that up infinitely, then you can continue to just scale the bandwidth you're monitoring infinitely. Great. All right. For Jibber Jabber, any disparities in the performance of speech to text across gender, age, accents, language, languages? Yeah. So there is a direct correlation between the number of uh, tokens or the minutes of audio that we have per language. So um, languages that are under supported do underperform. All right. This next one actually is, is, is for Tim. This is an area where answers really have to be right all the time. Giving 95% accurate tax or regulatory advice would give an agency a, a public black eye. You have a formal red teaming but what case, but what else can you do to give an agency confidence in 99% plus accuracy? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a couple of different reasons why there was the whole platform behind the front end chatbot is because we're trying to tackle a question, right, that requires a really high accuracy. You need to be able to flag those issues that then bring it back to human teams that then can provide that context. So that's why we have a lot of those monitoring capabilities within to not only check against like a, a rules engine for the generated response that then goes out through the chat, uh, but also flagging the uh, human factors of people interacting with that. So if there is something nuanced where the system is able to detect an issue, it can automatically route that to a human team of tax professionals that they can provide that context. 
So in the background, that additional context is not only making sure that the accuracy of that response for that nuanced question is something that then is at the high accuracy level, but then it's allowing the chatbot in the background to take all that additional context information that was provided by the human subject matter expert to then fix and re-optimize that LLM behind the, the chatbot interface. Great. Uh, this particular question is for uh, Jibber Jabber. Any any agencies like law enforcement currently using or testing this product? And if you are not, and if not, are you FedRAMP approved? This is actually the debut of Jibber Jabber, um, but we are looking for um, people that would be willing to help us take it to the next level. Great. Uh, this one's for Tim. How do you handle privacy? For instance, what happens if a user inputs PII as part of the prompt? Sure. And that's why we have a separation from both the front end a chat interface and the back end platform. Um, so the platform has the ability to uh, do masking of identify that uh, personal identifiable information and remove that before it transfers back into the, the main platform behind uh, the chatbot. Uh, to keep that division, as well as within the front interface, be able to flag that um, contextual information, isolate that um, so that you don't have people who are working in the back end platform and getting getting access to um, that personal identify the PI information. Great. And also uh, for, for Tim, do you have a working prototype? Yes, absolutely. So we have a working prototype. Uh, both of our entire platform and the different modules that I highlighted within our PowerPoint, as well as that front end interface uh, that we developed uh, for the tax and regulatory information. Um, definitely, if there's any agency interested, um, they can start, you know, playing around with those workflows, setting up their own red teams, experiment, swap in and out with different LLMs and do the fine tuning. Um, so if, if there is anyone interested in uh, getting a, a broader um, demonstration and playing around with the platform, uh, we welcome that. Great, and also for Tim, I noticed red teaming and quality control in your visual. Can you provide a bit more detail on those processes? Sure, yeah, so they have two distinct roles. Uh, and a lot of times people will develop quality controls, right? But if there's not a way to validate those quality controls and ways to check for potential bias, right? Then it's like, do they really work? And so the role of the red team is actually to, uh, one function is to actually take an adversarial testing. So you purposely have teams that are trying to figure out if the LLM has a bias, right? And so they're basically attacking it from the inside. And then that's what allows you to validate whether those quality controls that you defined within the workflows are at the appropriate configuration to be able to catch those issues that could happen right within the chat experience. So the way to look at it from, from our platform's perspective is that the quality controls are fully contr configurable, right? With the workflows, but then the red teaming allows you to kind of verify that those quality controls are working at the quality threshold that's required to make sure that you deliver accurate information. Great. Uh, this one's for Jibber Jabber. Can Jibber Jabber collect regular cell phone communications? This uh, does kind of touch on privacy. And uh, currently, we do not uh, support that not because the system intrinsically can't support something like that, just because that uh, is not legal here. And so we do have guardrails preventing the system from attempting to collect in frequencies that we shouldn't be, as well as uh, parameters on the model discouraging it from even attempting to tune the radio to these places. All right. Is there a range limitation in terms of what the system can monitor? How does your front end look? Yeah, so we uh, currently just test with software-defined radios, and so your range is going to be based off the um, antenna you're using uh, relative to the signal frequency you're attempting to collect, uh, as well as your terrain. Um, and so it really does depend how you want to deploy this, um, and that's why we're exploring the edge compute solution. So you could have this on a, on a mobile platform or a drone or somewhere that you can put it exactly into the response situation. All right, for Jibber Jabber as well. 
How exactly would county or state emergency management be able to connect their 800 megahertz radio systems and potentially monitor for communications across teams for common issues, identify emerging threats or trends, et cetera? Yeah, this should be relatively seamless. I believe you could just uh, prompt it to collect on the emergency management channel and it would just go there, start collecting. Um, and then you'd add uh, some prompts to the streams to ask, yeah, what, what issues are you detecting here? Can you categorize them into um, uh, a list of common issues? Great. And for figure eight, how does your system handle changes to tax law? Example, new tax cut, tax increases, et cetera. So that's actually why we picked, uh, picked uh, tax and regulatory uh, information as the, the first one to tackle with this platform was because basically we found that a lot of agencies we talked to, one of the struggles for uh, developing LLMs to integrate with existing systems was the problem that it was stagnant. Once you trained it, you weren't able to quickly and adaptively retrain and optimize for new information. Um, and so what we've done within the platform is we have the ability to connect to those different data sources, whether it's from, uh, you know, websites uh, or new tax laws, and then use that to restructure the data that they can be the fine tuning data that re-optimizes that LLM. So taking away the, the technical challenges from an agency of having to rely on a third party to update and optimize that LLM really empowering the government uh, uh, employees to leverage the platform itself, uh, just connecting to new data sources and uploading that and then fine tuning the LLM behind the chatbot. Uh, we are AI Asset Management and we are here to introduce RPA GPT to automate a work. I was talking on mute. Hi everybody, <laughs> welcome back from break. Uh, we are AI Asset Management, and uh, we are here to debut RPA GPT to automate tedious, repetitive contract work. All right, so let's discuss the problem as it exists today. A uh, new contract or a contract proposal will normally arrive by uh, email, and then that contract proposal has to be reviewed, uh, make sure that all the uh, I's are dotted, all the T's are crossed, all the boxes are checked. This normally results in a period of back and forth. Uh, this normally results in a period of back and forth between the contract officer and the vendor. Uh, and once that's done, it has to be loaded into a government database for later fulfillment. Uh, this is the way that roughly $680 billion in total government contracts are currently processed these days. Um, whenever there's a delay in this process, it has a lot of ripple effects down the line. Uh, delaying people getting the services and support that they need, especially in an emergency situation like we see with the wildfires or with earthquakes or that kind of thing. Uh, and we've also been told that this is especially true when you have a small business set aside or a Department of Defense contract because those have uh, additional requirements and complexity to them. When we talk to users of this process, both uh, from the contracting officer side and the vendor side, we kind of hear the same things over and over, which is that this is a time consuming task. It's very error prone, it's repetitive, uh, and the word drudgery seems to come up quite a lot. So we therefore came up with our solution, RPA GPT, which is actually uh, a few different AI products working together to solve this problem. So we start where you start uh, with the contract document. Uh, then we use currently an AWS model known as Textract, which is very good at processing PDFs and image files that contain tabular data, uh, checkboxes, uh, key value data, which is like you know the contracting officer is uh, Joe Smith, those kind of things. Uh, and then we apply our own filtering and our own quality control system to it to essentially translate it into text that can be used efficiently by these large language models, uh, which we symbolized here as GPT. Uh, that will allow us then to provide a natural language interface to your contract uh, so that rather than having to have this back and forth, uh, questions can be asked directly of the contract itself. It's pretty cool. 
Uh, once you are done with the verification and validation processes, we can also offer a number of different data formats to allow easy uploading of this data into a government database for their fulfillment. So we can really cut back on the amount of copy and paste and repetitive entries into uh, database forms. So just taking a look at some of the uh, features and innovations of our current system uh, versus say a very large foundational model that you have to train yourself, uh, we can work with a relatively small data set. So a big, uh, foundation model like ChatGPT, when you're training it, it requires sometimes millions or billions of documents. Uh, we feel we can get excellent results with much smaller data sets, uh, perhaps as few as a couple thousand documents. Um, we also have greater security than uh, a open model with an API that's out there on the web. Uh, we can work fully within the AWS or the Microsoft government clouds which already have security certifications. Uh, Textract itself can also live within the Gov Cloud, and our backend is modular, which means that we can swap between different language models, including large language models that you could post within your own cloud and within the own, your own barrier uh, of security, right? Uh, as far as accountability, you know, there's a lot of questions about the uh, quality of the answers that are coming back. Uh, our extraction system and our translation system that puts these items into a sort of GPT friendly format uh, allows it to link back directly to the source document. So if there's any question about the veracity of what's being said, uh, then you can quickly go back and double check it if you'd like. Uh, we've also been able to reduce the number of hallucinations as they're known through our uh, filtering system. Uh, finally, the cost of a lot of these foundational models tends to be enormous. So if you uh, read the AI news, you'll see that ChatGPT uh, costs something along the lines of $150 million to train. Uh, but because we start with a partially pre-trained foundation model and we move up from there, uh, we feel that our full implementation can be done for less than a million. So I feel like we can really get a lot of value for not a terribly large amount of money. Speaking of value, uh, let's talk about what kind of an impact, an economic impact we can have. Uh, the government contracting market right now is about 680 billion. Last year, it was also over uh, 600 billion, likely to stay well up in those numbers for uh, the foreseeable future. And in order to process all of those contracts, uh, we currently have about 46,000 contracting officers out there who we pay uh, 3.3 billion a year in uh, salaries. So if we can just get a 10% increase uh, on productivity of those employees, that would represent an economic lift of maybe as much as 330 million a year. And as far as the productivity boosts that we feel we can get, uh, we are certain we can improve your productivity and give you faster contract turnaround. Uh, by freeing up your contracting officers from having to answer repetitive questions over and over about the same contracts that are going out to different vendors, uh, that's going to allow you to do more with current staff, and the staff that you have will be able to focus on sort of the bigger picture issues rather than having to go back and forth on things all day. Uh, we're, <clears throat> we seek to uh, reduce the verification time on these complex contracts by as much as 50% and provide you a qualitatively improved process for government contracting. Okay. Um, as far as our advantages over other platforms, uh, we have worked greatly on our high accuracy document extraction method and the way that we translate those documents into GPT friendly forms uh, with like a hierarchical context gives us extremely high accuracy on our uh, on our question and answer task, right? We can handle any document, even documents that have a lot of tables in them, even documents that are very data-driven, we can pull those out. Once we have the data loaded into our system, we can also uh, provide you with almost any data format that you want. So currently you can get it as an Excel, uh, you can chat with it as a large language model, uh, which we'll do that in just a minute. Uh, you can get the sources of the data from the large language model. 
Uh, and of course, you can download it as an Excel, a CSV. We can integrate it into SQL databases. Uh, anything that you need, we can uh, handle it with our data structures. All right. So let me do a quick intro of our natural language processing team here. Uh, Mr. Lum is our CEO and fearless leader. Uh, he's been through several of these uh, SBIR and STTR processes. Um, he holds degrees from Stanford School of Business and also from MIT. Uh, we also have from MIT, Dr. Bob Berwick. He uh, has helped us out with our uh, natural language models and a lot of the difficulties that we that you encounter with uh, large bodies of text. Uh, and then finally, there's me. Uh, I have been a software developer for about 20 years now. Uh, for the last four or five years, I've focused very heavily on machine learning, artificial intelligence, natural language processing. And specifically, uh, my focus is in building the end user experience so that uh, the data will flow fully through the system back and forth. More complicated than it sounds. Um, as far as our onboarding system and our plans after today uh, are that we would spend about a month determining customer requirements. So what I mean there is we will meet with uh, both contracting officers and vendors and talk about uh, what are the main pain points and the slowdown points that we're seeing day to day in these contracts and get really specific down to, well, checkbox 19B and the language around it is uh, not so clear, right? Things of that nature. Uh, once we have that, then we're going to need to collect documents uh, to demonstrate every one of the pain points that you're talking about and all of the edge cases uh, that you need to care for. And then finally, we or next, we need to spend about three months to train up our system uh, on that document set and quality test it and ensure that we're getting uh, good extraction and also good answers out of our large language model on the other end. Uh, and then finally, you know, a cool language model doesn't work great if nobody can use it. And so uh, next we would want to integrate with your customer operations and ensure that there is a public facing uh, web front and also there's an internally facing web front so that everybody can have access to the powers of the screen. Uh, once we get it up and running, uh, and we're at the end of this timeline over here, then we estimate that it'll take between 1,000 and 10,000 a month uh, per document repository to really keep things going. Um, it depends really on the size of the document repository that we're looking at. Our current status is we are developing this with the U.S. Air Force STTR program. Uh, we're looking for up to one and a quarter million in development funding to develop this uh, custom system for the Department of Defense. Uh, once we have that system rolled out, then uh, we also have designs on the commercial sector. We feel that's where the big economic lift will eventually come from. Uh, if we could make all employees 10% more efficient, obviously that's going to uh, greatly improve our overall economy. Okay, so that is enough hype. Let's go and actually see the product in action. Uh, so this is it, and first I'm going to ask it to download my original document um, so that we can take a quick peek at what we're talking about. There we are. Uh, so this is a contract that we previously did uh, with our fearless leader. Uh, Mr. Alam was one of the subjects of this contract, and it is a pretty long, complicated sort of document. Uh, but you can ask all kinds of questions about that document just to start out. Uh, you know, we could get some factual information. So what's the contracting officer and the contract number? Uh, it can also answer conceptual information. So what should I do if there is a dispute? Okay. Now that references, this essentially says that you need to go to your contracting officer for a resolution first. If you can't do that, then you may contact the ombudsman. So you can ask follow-up questions as well, uh, like what does the ombudsman do? Pretty good answer there. It discusses the uh, functions of the ombudsman and uh, what they can and cannot do. Uh, you can also ask summarization questions. So for instance, summarize the statement of work of this contract.
Oh no. Well, it was summarizing it earlier. <laughs> Guess we need to work on that particular question a bit more. Uh, and then finally, you can uh, download an Excel version of your data uh, that is formatted by uh, the page number, uh, table number that breaks down each individual uh, table, pulls out all of the form fields, uh, references which pages. Uh, there's color code in here to let you know when a particular field is not as high confidence as the others. Uh, but this would allow for uh, you know, obviously further loading into other databases. Pretty cool in the things. Okay. So to sum up, uh, our objective is to improve the $680 billion a year contract processing systems within the government. Uh, our system is secure, private, portable. Uh, it's obviously modular, so you can use different large language models. We can move between clouds, if you uh, need to use the Microsoft cloud versus the AWS cloud. Uh, and ultimately, we would like to deploy something very similar to this to the commercial sector, where we feel there's huge opportunity because there is a vast amount of this, uh, you know, especially like tabular data that is a little bit difficult to deal with with LLMs. And I feel like, by and large, we have come up with a good system for dealing with that information. Um, and with that, I guess we can uh, go to questions and answers if anybody would like. Johnny, you're trying to do my job. That was <laughs> thought provoking, though. Up next, we'll hear from SoCat. Oh, where's my camera? Hi, everyone. We're so excited to be here. Um, I'm S Susan, I'm the CEO of. SoCat, and I'm also joined here this afternoon by Jim Liu, who is the president of SoCat. He's going to be helping me with the Q&A um, that will take place right after our presentation. So just give me one second to pull up presentation. Hi, everyone, and welcome to SOCAT's presentation of our solicitation management and request tool for the 2023 GSA Applied AI LLM Challenge. Federal procurement staff are our unsung heroes, navigating a maze filled with inefficiencies, complexities, and risks, all to keep our society thriving. The federal procurement process challenges are due to Limitations on time and resources. The process is often labor intensive and time consuming, especially for complex acquisitions. A lack of standardization. Practices can vary widely between different agencies or even different teams, leading to inconsistencies in solicitations. Complexity. The rules and regulations governing federal procurement are complex and extensive, making it difficult for less experienced staff to navigate the process. Difficulty in capturing needs. Translating agency needs into clear specific requirements can be challenging, particularly for complex projects. The risk of protests. If the solicitation isn't clear or the evaluation criteria are not well-defined, it increases the risk of bid protests, which can delay the procurement process and increase costs. And the burden of regulatory compliance. Ensuring that the solicitation complies with a wide variety of regulations and laws, such as the FAR, is time-consuming and burdensome especially to new procurement staff hires. But what if there was a way to simplify federal procurement with the latest advances in large language model technology? That's where we come in. Meet SMART, your guide to simplifying and automating contract requirements. SMART leverages LLMs to automate the drafting of contract requirements, focusing on the most challenging aspects of federal procurements. What sets SMART apart is its simplicity. It consists of only four features that work together for maximum effect. The user inputs a problem statement. The AI engine trains itself on past statement of work requirements. The LLM engine generates new requirements. And finally, the user can interact with SMART's AI chatbot to edit the new requirements, which is a feature that is almost ready to launch. You can reach out to us next week, and we'd love to have you interact with it. We've outlined the challenges in federal procurement and how SMART aims to address them. 
but nothing speaks more clearly than an actual demo of a tool. So at this time, we'll move from concept to application and show you how SMART actually works. We built a prototype in Python using VS Code and Streamlit. The large language model that we used here is OpenAI's GPT 3.5 Turbo 16K, but any large language model could be used here, including Hugging Face open source models. Now I will type in streamlit run app.py. This will give us the local browser, but we could also do this in the cloud. First, the user starts by simply dragging and dropping old statements of work into the document bank that are related to the problem they're trying to solve. These SOWs, aside from historical information about past programs and contracts, also contain valuable institutional knowledge of the agency staff, which are a treasure trove of experience and insights that will aid significantly in generating precise requirements for the user. Second, the user makes a selection for the type of document to generate. Presently, our prototype offers requirements only, but we plan to build out more complex acquisition documents, such as RFIs, RFPs, and SOWs. Third, the user hits enter to have SMART start training itself on the old SOWs that were dropped in the document bank. Fourth, the user types in the problem statement and SMART generates a first draft of requirements based on the problem statement and the prior SOWs in the document bank. Here we type, based on this PWS, please write me requirements to buy software that automates gathering agency intelligence. Then we hit enter. And SMART is processing the SOWs and the problem statement and will generate the first draft of the new requirements. Finally, the user can edit or delete each requirement. You can see here. In addition, a feature that is currently under development is an interactive AI chatbot with which the user will interact with in editing the draft requirements. Essentially, this chatbot will serve as a virtual mentor, drawing on the experience and wisdom of past agency staff in guiding the user in refining these draft requirements. By using SMART, you're not just making your life easier, you're also contributing to a more efficient and transparent federal procurement process due to the tool's following benefits. One, increased compliance, since your requirements are based on those that have already met regulatory compliance. Two, since there's a significant reduction in the time spent on drafting requirements. Three, customization, users can edit with the assistance of our AI chatbots specifically designed and trained on the agency's past documents. And four, learning capability. SMART continuously improves by training on old statements of works and the interactions of new agency staff. By training SMART on these old SOWs, we're not just automating, we're imbuing the tool with the collective wisdom and experience of your agency. This makes SMART not just a tool, but a knowledge partner in your procurement process. Now that you've seen the impact and key features of SMART, let's discuss how it aligns with the federal government's mission, a critical factor for technology adoption by agencies. Streamlining contract writing. SMART streamlines the contract writing process for greater efficiency, which directly benefits public services by accelerating project timelines, enhances transparency and accountability. We will incorporate features like built-in audit trails and real-time reporting, which has been our approach in past AI applications for government in order to enhance transparency and account accountability in federal contracting. 
ethical guidelines, and data privacy. All data will be hosted on a secure internal cloud platform and the tool will comply with all applicable data privacy measures. Quality assurance audits. SMART will undergo regular audits for quality insurance, ensuring that it meets the high standards required for federal acquisition processes. Continuous updates and user feedback. In order to ensure that SMART is accurate, reliable, and effective, SMART features regular updates based on user feedback ensuring that it evolves to meet the changing needs of federal acquisition. While building SMART, we've gained some invaluable insights that are shaping its future development. We initially started out aiming to leverage LLMs to automate an entire statement of work and ultimately entire RFIs and RFPs. We learned, however, that while SMART excels at generating individual contract requirements, it currently falls short of generating those more complex documents because we need additional functionality such as an expanded statement of work RFI and RFP template library, meaning a greater repository of pre-approved templates that can serve as the foundation for expanding the tool to these documents. A dynamic content generation capability, which is the ability to automate it, automatically populate sections like deliverables, evaluation criteria and compliance checks based on the initial problem statement and a compliance checker, which will be an automated system that cross references the SOW, RFI and RFP against federal regulations. Given these insights, we're adopting a phased approach for SMART's development. Phase one focuses on automating the generation of requirements, solving an immediate pain point and demonstrating value. Once we've refined this based on user feedback, We'll move to phase two, which will expand SMART's capabilities to generate full SOWs and eventually full RFIs and RFPs. This approach allows us to deploy quickly, validate the tool's efficacy, and then scale its functionalities all while maintaining compliance and quality. SMART is not just a concept, it's a feasible solution. So we'll talk about why you can have confidence in SMART's feasibility. One, integration with existing IT infrastructure. SMART is designed to seamlessly integrate into existing agency IT infrastructure. We've successfully accomplished this in our past pilot programs, leveraging LLM to automate effective outcomes. For example, at HHS, we designed and built an AI model to analyze over 4 million contract components and history data, which empowered HHS contract writers to quickly and precisely use historical statements of work, evaluation criteria, and line items. This model was designed using a microservices architecture and delivered in a secure cloud format, which allows for ease of integration and endless scalability. Real-time reporting features. To monitor tool performance and usage, SMART will provide real-time reporting features through user-friendly dashboards. Open documentation. Since transparency is key, we'll maintain open documentation of algorithms and methodologies used, ensuring transparency in operations. In the interest of time, we're not able to walk through our entire tech stack for small part, but we're absolutely happy to answer any questions after this presentation, as well as meet afterwards to explain our tech stack in detail. Security measures. We can ensure that SMART is safe, secure, and resilient by hosting it internally on an agency's cloud platform, as we did most recently with our project in the VA. There, we built our AI model on the VA's internal cloud system called the VA Enterprise Cloud, which ensured maximum security and complied with the most stringent of PII and PHI privacy regulations. Accuracy and reliability. Our model prioritizes human feedback to continually refine its output. This makes it not only increasingly more accurate and reliable, but also provides crucial insight to the tool's usability and functionality, which can be used to make the system more effective and user-friendly. And lastly, alignment with federal mission and ethical guidelines. SMART is fully aligned with the federal government's mission. It enhances transparency, will undergo regular audits for quality assurance, and incorporates ethical guidelines and data privacy measures such as Executive Order 13960's promoting the use of trustworthy artificial intelligence in the federal government. 
we've hopefully established that SMART is a practical, feasible solution that can integrate seamlessly into your existing systems. However, you may still have questions about our capability to successfully implement this technology. Our ex expertise in designing and building LLMs is well established through a proven track record of successfully developing and deploying LLM tools in various sectors. For example, we recently launched Farsight, an AI-based tool to help procurement staff with FAR-compliant documents. At the VA, we designed and built an AI-based prediction model that used LLM and sentiment analysis, and it was fully built on the VA's internal cloud platform. At HHS, we designed, built, and deployed across the federal government an AI ML model for risk assessment and fraud detection in federal grant recipients. We also built another AI model for HHS that was an AI power contract writing system that automated the creation of acquisition contracts for HHS procurement staff. In addition to these projects, we have a winning track record in AI LLM competitions. In 2019, we won GSA's ML AI Challenge, coming in third place. In 2021, we came in second place in the VA's AI Tech Sprint Challenge with our AI-powered healthcare chatbot for veterans. And in 2022, we won phase one of the VA's Mission Daybreak Suicide Challenge with our AI-powered data integration platform solution. These past projects serve as evidence of both their technical capabilities and their commitment to creating solutions that are self safe, reliable, and effective. In conclusion, SMART is set to revolutionize federal acquisition by automating the drafting of contract requirements and simplifying the federal procurement process. We invite you to choose SMART and let's build a better future for federal acquisitions together. Thank you so much for your time, and we look forward to your questions and feedback. How interesting. Now I'm going to pass the mic to Omar to lead the economy Q&A. Uh, thank you all. Thank you, Ebony. Uh, you know, also feel free to, you know, put in your questions so far for, for the two. We only have two questions, one for each particular company. So please uh, feel free to answer questions. So the first one is for RPA GPT. How do you train users to engage with your product? Specifically, how do you troubleshoot issues like you've encountered in the demo? Sure. So as far as training our end users to interact with your product, um, the great thing about LLMs is that they can talk to you. So if you ask it questions like, what sort of capabilities do you have or what can you work on, uh, then we can set up to answer those things. And then as far as the SOW, PSW uh, authoring, it can certainly help with that as far as a knowledge of the regulations underlying your work and offering outlines and helping you, uh, you know, draft certain paragraphs and things along those, those lines. Okay. So yeah, you address that, that second question. Uh, your demo about existing contracts, how does your product help generate PWSs and sounds? So far, everyone feel free to feel free to ask more questions. Uh, I know it takes a little while to type it, but the, the, uh, currently uh, those are the only two questions we received. Oh, I'm sorry. I think I missed someone's question there, which was, how do you report an issue when you have an issue? Yes. So um, basically in the same general way that you would do it with something like ChatGPT. So if you get a bad answer, we'll have a little thumbs down button uh, and you can tell us and we can uh, go through additional training and um, take the uh, chat bot out behind the building and explain what's wrong and help it to do right the, the next time. So. <laughs> Great. So this, this particular question is for SOCAT. If you are training on existing contracts, is there a risk of leakage of confidential contract information when generating new contracts? That's a great question. So the way that we think about it is we want the data to stay within the agency. So this would be housed inside the agency and you would use the uh, contract and information that the agency already has generated in the past. And, you know, we're using a embedding space, uh, you know, a vector store and so forth. So, you know, leveraging semantic search that LLMs provide and they do a really great job. And, you know, that's what we think that 
the agency should control all the data. <laughs> it should be used inside the agency only for the people who work at that particular agency. So that's how we would control it. Thank you. And really quick reminder, please uh, answer your questions not in the chat and specifically use the, the Q&A function. Uh, so we have another question for SOCAT. Do you need fine tuning to adjust to style guides from different agencies? Again, a great question. You know, fine tuning is a little bit extensive. While we could do that per agency, you know, we think the a vectorized storage way is the way to go uh, initially for the requirements. But you know, the way that we thought about it is we want to chop the problem up in small pieces that we know the LLM can solve. And so as we you know work on the requirements, we keep the human in the loop, have a lot of discussions that these are the right requirements, and then we're going to start adding the other pieces in at a certain stage. You know, absolutely. Uh, fine tuning may come into play, but you know we are building and learning at the same time. And you know while there's a lot of um, promise in LLM, I still think that you know we have to be careful how we roll this out and make sure that there's a lot of people taking a look at this and you know making it useful at the end of the day. Great. Uh, currently, there are not any more questions. Ah, okay. So for both RPA and GPT, or for RPA, GPT, and SOCAP, uh, we'll answer, uh, we'll do RPA, GPT first. Do you have estimates of time or money savings for implementing your product? Obviously, this depends on agency, on the agency slash scale, but general estimates are fine. Um, uh, RPA, GPT first. Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, yeah, so we feel like we can improve the efficiency of this price process by like 25 to 50 percent and so since the uh, total cost of the process just on the contracting officer side is about 3.3 billion uh, you know 300 million 600 million probably productivity lift uh, as far as the vendor side uh, obviously there's a lot of small business vendors who have a lot of difficulty uh, doing these contracts and so if we can get a similar productivity lift for them uh, then I think that might even be a bigger economic payoff than just through the contracting officers. So that's just generally what we're thinking. Um, so, you know, we would have to agree with uh, what Johnny said. I think at least a 25% sort of, you know, decrease in, um, you know, expenses for doing this work using, uh, you know, large language models and GPT. Um, maybe between 25 and 50%, depending on how well-versed we all become using this. And you know, to the extent that it can actually solve and create, you know, um, RFPs and RFIs very quickly. So I think initially it will be, you know, a pretty good savings. But eventually, in the steady state, we may hit that fifty percent savings. So I would agree. Great. Uh, next question is for SoCat. How do you handle biases? So to the extent that the prior um, solicitations and RPIs and statement of works have biases, indeed there will be biases there. But we have to be vigilant as always, and the human will identify these biases. So we will not move the human out of the loop. The human will always make the final decision, and we will actively make sure that we have as many stakeholders there taking a look at the output and giving feedback and adjusting and sort of you know improving these models over time. And I think it's important to note that you know what you we see right now is kind of like that chess game where you know it's not working very well for the AI. But over time, as we get more and more data and we continue to work and, you know, GSA continues to have these challenges and we bring the smartest people into the room and we create um, products, we're going to get to that really, really great, great uh, place where, you know, will the AI become uh, as good as the best contract writer? You know, that's within the realm of possibilities in our lifetime. So, you know, it's very exciting. Great. And this is uh, for SoCA kind of following up to what uh, about the bias question. Not all sows are the best quality. Is there a risk that the model could replicate common problems in existing statements of work? So our grandiose idea, I'll just share it. It's a little bit out there, but you know, these contracts and SOWs are just the beginning stage. At the very end, you get a CPAR. So to the extent that you can actually model how well the beginning start, you think of it as a seed you're growing a plant, it grows and it bears fruits. And that's the ultimate contract that's executed upon. 
at the end, you get a grade, right? And so to the extent that we can pull all this data together, we'll be able to identify which SOs were written well, that gave a really great outcome for the, the government at the end of the day for the taxpayer, and which ones were not written very well. But it may be a problem, not necessarily on how the SOW is written, but maybe on the requirements and maybe on the evaluation criteria, it could be a lot of other things. But what I think is so exciting about this is we are opening this door and we're all gonna figure this out together and share the knowledge across government. So it's 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 a very exciting um, time period for contractors and for the government. All right, and then uh, another particular question is for, for this is and this is for both RPA and and, uh, and SoCat. Is there any is there any inkage between the requirements it writes and evaluation criteria? Does it develop evaluation criteria in conjunction with requirements? So I can take a crack at that. So we will be working with our plus customers. Uh, unlike other systems, this is a bespoke a bespoke uh, system that we will install there. And each agency, what we are finding, has different needs. So we will be working with them with their, with their specific requirements and getting it, getting it to the kind of quality requirements that they need. There are some general metrics out there for measuring how well a language model does, but we think of more fine-tuned one. That's why we have the three months uh, of running it and evaluating. So Kat, did you want to answer? Um, you know, I would agree. This is very, very complex. And, you know, we're just scratching the surface here. And I do think that it's intertwined, but at the same time, each agency has its own intricacies. And, you know, it, it's it's fair, it's it's not as easy as you would think. <laughs> it's not like you just put in a bunch of documents and you let the AI run and it, uh, it outputs something. Uh, you know, it, it, you know, there's a bunch of other things that go on. Um, it, there may be some internal issues, there may be some legacy issues, there may be some regulation that's coming down the line and so forth. So, you know, I think it's a really, really interesting and challenging problem. And so um, I don't think uh, any, uh, and at least we don't know the answer yet, but as we dig in and we start investigating and sharing sort of our results across the different agencies, across government, across academic circles and industry, I think we'll all come to sort of a better understanding of this. And I think it's also um, important to understand that we're all kind of learning <laughs> together as we get more data and we see the limitations um, you know, of AI and you know, where AI can go wrong. So for example, hallucination, how did that occur? Well, we all started using ChatGPT and we said, hey, this is not answering correctly, but it's very confident and it's wrong answer. So I think we'll see some more of those types of risks that pop up as we continue to uh, march down this, this road together. Great. Uh, Follow-up question to that uh, is, is SMART a subset or refinement of what's in Farsight? Since I would think that the FAR compliant document includes a statement of work. Absolutely. So we started down this thought process uh, first creating Farsight, which is basically a chatbot trained on the FARs in order to answer questions for contracting officers and program managers. And, you know, we, we, we put the guardrails in to make sure that it did, it's hallucinated very uh, a low probability hallucination. And then from there, we thought to ourselves, well, is there a way we can take it a step further? What's a big problem that the government has been trying to solve for a long time? We've heard about this problem two or three years ago, even longer when we first started getting into government contracting. And so we knew that was a big pain point as we sort of, you know, talked to people in the government. Um, so, you know, we've always been thinking about this, but I think we're at that point where, um, you know, these tools, these technologies, um, you know, we have a, we have a shot of really making a, you know, impactful uh, sort of play here together. And I, I think it will take a lot of companies. It's not just going to be us. You know, there will be many other companies that are solving these similar problems across different agencies. So it's very exciting. Are you are you incorporating practices to obfuscate the data when in interacting with LLMs? Um, so the way we think about it, it's got to sit inside the agency. So the agency will have access to all the data and the agency can, you know, uh, take out name entity, reckon, um, you know, the, the, it, it can mask it if they want to. If, if not, then that's okay too. Um, we, we probably leave that uh, at the discretion of the agencies. And some agencies will do that and some possibly will not. Okay. Uh, RPA, have you have you worked at all on this is for RPA? Have you worked at all on grant make 
on grant making or research funding versus traditional procurement? So the answer is that system is generalizable enough so that it can work across any kind of contract. Uh, grant making is slightly different and each agency will be slightly different. That being said, our first customer and the people who are funding us to get, get the system to them are doing contracts even when they give money out. So it will be contracts first and then there's no reason why we can't generalize it to, uh, to grants. All right, this particular question is for both. We'll start with RPA. Do you envision an eventual scenario where government will use automated tools to put out bunch, a bunch of documents, then contractors will use similar methods to write proposals and eventually government evaluating these contracts using AI as well? So my take on that, since I've been in AI since I was a freshman at MIT, is nothing will be fully automated. That doesn't exist, never will. So it will always be human assisted. We will we will insist that a human review it and say it goes, but the process will be far more automated and far more efficient so that you can spend more time on the things that you really want to do rather than reading through documents and making sure everything is, every uh, I is dotted and every T is crossed. We 100% agree. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. Uh, this is the uh, next question is for SOCAT. There is an implicit assumption that what made a contract good in the past will stay the same. How do you think about evolving needs for high quality contracts, for example, from emerging technology contracts? I think, you know, transparency will be important. Um, people have to understand, you know, how the technology is working, even if it's a very um, uh, cutting edge emerging uh, technology, there's got to be some kind of explanation of how this is, works. I think that's not going to change. Um, the other thing is, um, you know, we've seen this over time. Uh, there's technologies that come and get, everyone gets very excited. They don't sort of live up to the hype. We, so, so we've seen this go up and down a few times. Um, you know, I think AI is real, large language models is real, and I think this can really benefit not only the government, but, you know, we see this in the ivory tower and also across healthcare. So this is uh, going to have a, a major impact on, you know, our society, our economy, you know, the world, humanity. And so I, I don't think that this is a fad, but, the, you know, with that said, um, there will be parts of AI that will become sort of, you know, sort of, you know, um, overhyped, let's say. And uh, so, you know, personally, I think the embedding space and the vector storage makes a lot of sense because, you know, I can use it myself and figure out how that's very useful. Um, and, you know, it's got to solve a business problem and it's got to be better than what we did in the past. And, that, you know, those are the two questions I always ask myself in order to see if something like this is going to stick. Great, we appreciate it. We came to time with the uh, with the questions. Uh, gonna hand back to Ebony. Thank you, Omar, AI Asset, and SOCAP. Also, did I hear someone say they wanna benefit the taxpayers? I love it. Now I'm wondering who's ready for our last category? It's time to hear more about how LLMs can help provide us simple, seamless, and secure customer experience across federal government services and platforms. The floor is yours, Topology. Hello, everybody. I'm going to share my screen. All right, everyone to see that? All right. My name is Graham Moorhead. I am the CTO of Topology. I'm also an adjunct professor at Gonzaga and I teach artificial intelligence. Um, we're a small company, but we've been around since 2002 and we do bespoke AI solutions for different agencies like the FAA and DOD. Okay, we make AI that supports different interests, but our mission is to bring the best of academia to bear on government interests. We have lots of different programs, like one that breaks other AI. It's an adversarial AI used to fight drones. And what we're gonna talk about today though, is AI that distinguishes LLM text from human text. We can distinguish LLM text from human text because there are deep patterns in all text that humans or AIs unknowingly lay down. And our detector is pretty good. Now, obviously we all have improvements we can make 
but you'll see why this is really good. And that ROC number is the most important here. That is an indicator of how much you can trust the output. Imagine you're the EPA and you are required to take public sentiment on something, public comment. But imagine out there somewhere, there is a special interest group that has a bot that uses an LLM. And they're just pelting you with comments that you don't know they're not coming from humans. You have people say, oh, we don't need clean water, repeal the Clean Water Act, or my kids miss swimming in pollution, get rid of the CWA. Who needs a CWA? The Sani is for everyone. Obviously, this is a joke. But what if we're talking about something that's more nuanced, something that maybe like net neutrality or carbon credits? What if the government is taking sentiment or public comments on something that's important, but they don't quite know what people are going to think? One special interest group could hijack the entire thing with an LLM. So distinguishing LLM from human text promotes trust, and it's like a kind of authentication. It's another way of saying, are you a human? And it's more and more important in this important age of you know, AI-generated spam, fake news. It's going to save lives if we can do this too. Now, think about the, the way LLMs have come on the scene. They actually were invented in like 2017 with BERT, but no one paid attention back then. I've been working in AI since the late 90s and nobody cared about it until now. But now for the first time in my life, my mother is asking me about an AI model. She's asking me about GPT, for instance. Uber drivers ask me about it. Everybody's asking me things and it's never been like this. And it's partly because ChatGPT is the most viral app we've ever seen. It went to 100 million users in just two months. There's never been anything like it. Now, it's not the only large language model. If you go on Hugging Face, you can find 300,000 300, models you can use, and many of them are LLMs, and many of them are just super easy to use. These models are free, and they're available, and they are easy to use. Just three lines of code get you started these three lines. I prompted it with, hello, I'm a language model. And it came out with, hello, I'm a language modeler. Already it's changing that sentence. It's no longer sounding like a model. It sounds like a modeler, which sounds like a human's job. So just out of the box, without any special prompting, it's pretending to be a human. I write and maintain software in Python. I love to code, and that includes coding things that require writing. Just three lines of code. Now, if OpenAI were to make an LLM detector, they would be best at it in that sense for their model only though. That's what's called a white box full knowledge model. They would have access to the raw numbers that come out of the model, not just the words. And with that, they could make the best GPT detector, but they haven't done that. There is something called GPT-0, and there's also an academic project called OutFox, and they are very accurate, but these are gray box or some knowledge attacks. The idea is they know which model you're talking about, and ahead of time, they've already gathered thousands, maybe millions, of examples of data or text generated by that specific model. Now, the weakness of this is, what if someone uses a model you haven't prepared for? Then you don't know. What if you don't, you have 10 models you've trained for, like chat GPT, GPT-4, GPT-2, Llama-2, BARD. Let's say you trained for each of those, but all your models say, eh, it's not that model, it's not that model. And one of them says, it's probably this model. How much do you know you can trust that? You see, the other th aspect is there are other features. There's something called temperature, which is like a creativity dial. 
When you're using an LLM like GPT, you can turn up the creativity or down, and they just call it temperature. So if you're GPT-0 and you have trained your LLM detector to detect chat GPT, but then someone changed the temperature, your model doesn't work anymore. These gray box attacks may appear to be accurate, but they are not practical at all. That's why we've come up with a black box attack, a zero knowledge attack. And yes, for now, our accuracy is a little lower, but we have a high confidence in it and we're just getting started. So the other models will scrape the entire internet for human generated content and then gather enormous amounts of data from every specific LLM. Remember, their models are LLM specific and they rely on massive models utilizing classical methods to learn just for a single type of LLM. And these are, this whole pipeline has to be done every time someone comes out with a new LLM. Now, what if a bad actor were to train their own LLM and not release it to the you know, open source community? Well, you have no hope, no hope of getting it, but we do. Their models are built in these giant meat grinders and matrices, whereas ours are looking for this thing we call a watermark. Now, when you write an essay, you will leave a little bit of your style, your personality in that essay. But when an LLM does it, it has another kind of stylistic mark it leaves on the words. And it has to do with the way the words connect to each other across a document or a piece of text. The nature of it, the fractal nature of the shape of that topologically. So our models can find that no matter what the passage length, no matter what the topic, no matter what the context, no matter what type of words they're using. And we're using statistical learning methods, AI, different AI methods, but using our unique watermark features. It is efficient and it's scalable. And we can recognize an LLM that no one's ever been exposed to. Now, the watermarking can be thought of as a space, a watermark space. So these are human generated texts that we plot somewhere in our watermark space. And then we start to build up a region around that area. Then when we come across new text and we plot it and it's not in the human watermark region, we know it's watermark is different. And that's how we can identify it as LLM text. Let me give you a little demo. Okay, these are some texts that were generated by GPT. And our likelihood engine is saying that yes, anything above 0.5, we're saying it is generated by an LLM. Now, here's some human examples. So it's gonna print the text and then print what's after it. Print the, all of these values are below 0.5. So we say they are human written and these are in fact written by human. Now, this is a mixed set. I want you to look at the text that's about to print out on the screen. I know it may be very small. Um, try to decide what you think. Is that written by a human or not? Our model says it was written by a human because it's below 0.5. How about this one? Human. AI, that was written by a large language model. Written by a large language model. Written by a large language model. Large language model, large language model, large language model, human. 
All right. So we're just beginning. This project started not too long ago, and we have plenty of work to do to improve our watermarking space. I'd love to take some of your questions. We, it is our pleasure to support government agencies. That's all we do. And we are currently working with the FAA, DOD. We have various vehicles. And I would also like to introduce my team. My team is here with me. And one of our guys is Josh Oliver. He is a PhD student. And he is the one that trained the model I just showed you. And he is welcome to help out with questions. Thank you, Topology team. Now I'll pass the mic to Omar to lead the customer experience Q&A. Great. Thank you, Ebony. All right. So the first particular question is, to be clear, OpenAI did create a chat GPT detector and the big fanfare, it pulled the model as it didn't do a good job. And they provided the particular link. Now, that's just a, that's just a comment. If you wanted to provide any sort of commentary to that, feel free to. Josh, feel free to jump in. Yeah, so OpenAI has tried to figure out their own model, and they've kind of fell first on their face. They're kind of the type to push things out when they see things working, and then when they have crowdsourcing, you know, billions of people working on it, they see that their methods fail stupendously. And I think this is the problem with trying to use, even with having full access to their own models, they're using these, like, like Graham talked about, these meat grinder approaches. You're trying to just like have statistical learning do all the work for you. And we're starting to realize that NLP is a different space, a different modality of information and requires a lot more human interaction with the feature engineering, specifically with having like rigorous mathematical modeling to do more of the work for us than just having magic machine learning figure it out. All right, so another question is, can the model be prompted to explain what parts of a text led to scoring it as a human slash LLM? Right now, we have not coded it that way because we look at holistically. You could look at any subset of the text and apply the model if you want. Next question. Can you also differentiate between LLMs or just between human and LLM? Right now, just between humans and LLMs. The underlying patterns that we're looking for go back to the first principles of linguistics. And there are ways that humans take their thoughts and turn them into a sequence of words. And that mechanism is mathematically different than what an LLM does. That's where we find that differentiation point. Josh, do you have anything to add to that? No, Graham, I think you explained that well. All right, you brought up GPT and Watermark. How different are you seeing scores? How different are you seeing scores between the different version? Two, three, two, three, three point five, four. Is it getting better simulating people as versions come? I haven't noticed a difference yet, but we haven't tested for that. A very interesting demo. What would happen with content that is initially generated with an LLM but modified significantly by a human? Also, aside from public comment pages, what would be a practical use case for this product in government? So if you start out with something that's purely LLM generated and change those one or two words, we might still think it's LLM generated. And I don't know where that break point is. And it's gonna be, think about it like any typical watermark. If you have an image that has a watermark, how many pixels do you have to change before that watermark is gone? It's not all of them. Maybe it's five, 10%, and you only tweak them by a little bit. It's the same kind of thing with words. Um, there are other use cases that have to do, I think, with national security. If we know that a foreign power is trying to use LLM generated text to influence our population at scale, which could be done. That is another use case for this detector. Great. Are there any academic papers published on your method of detection? No. And we might want to keep it secret as soon as you let it out. People are going to 
get around it. The other thing about this is if we were to leave up an API that anybody could use to the max of their desire, then they could simply create a black box attack against this detector. So it's a little bit like antibiotics. You don't want to overuse it. All right. False positives predicting the text is written by an LLM when it is written by a human can have a major negative impact for, hu for the human author. Have you disaggregated the false positive rate across demographics of authors and languages to ensure underserved populations are not adversely affected at a higher rate? This is a very good question. We do intend to carefully monitor the ethical considerations of this. Um, our current data set does not even have that information in it, so we haven't done that yet. But yes, that is a very important question. All right. Chatbot can now be customized using personality, prompts, and contextual description. Do you use, do the use of detailed personalities confound your detector? No. This should be totally robust to that. All right. Can you explain how you use how you are able to perform watermarking in a black spot black box manner? My understanding is that watermarked LLM text has to be included in the original model, i.e., a watermark is a white box system. Okay, it what we're doing is we call it a watermark, but it's really something else. And it comes from the theoretical underpinnings of how humans connect words. Think about what you do in your head. You blue sky and go home. We know those words are connected because they're right next to each other. But if you have a sentence more complicated, like Jack gave Jill a book, now the word give is connected to three things. You have to connect them using complex patterns like word order. Some languages use suffixes. And this tree shape on the right, that tree is everything. Humans think in terms of trees. That's why language is tree shaped. It comes from that tree. But LLM text comes from a totally different shape. It's a self-attention block that is basically a matrix of numbers. And just to cut this short, it's a bunch of numbers stacked on top of each other in a pile so high, you could call it a meat grinder of numbers. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about a watermark. That leaves an indelible pattern on the text. All right, what about the potential ethical issues an LLM detector might raise? What if certain people or demographics writing styles frequently gets flagged as an LLM, especially compared to a typical writer? Uh, examples, second language, non-native speakers, et cetera. This could be problem problematic in academia. Also, what about once LLM-based tools start being used, especially for translation services or writing assistance? Does flagging these introduce bias towards the groups who may need more assistance in writing? Wow, that's a really, I hadn't thought of the last one. Um, if someone needs more assistance in writing and they use an LLM to write most of it, it's going to start off thinking that it's written by an LLM. It just is. They're going to have to change it enough so that it stops thinking that. Um, the watermarking that an LLM leaves on the text, it will be there. If an LLM wrote it, um, there's no way around that. Um, I do hope that people view this as just one tool. For instance, if somebody is contacting you and they're saying that they are you know, your family member and they want you to send them money, I hope that you, you know, get on the phone and confirm that it really is them. Same kind of thing here. If somebody gets flagged as having written something with an LLM, it's just a step that says, you know what? We need to confirm they're a human using a secondary method, TFA, 2FA, for instance, some other method. Is updating the foundation model required? Yes, we would always be training the foundational model as we get slightly better watermarking space design. That whole set of things is basically our features. In machine learning, one of the things you do is you try to make sure you have the right features, try to learn new features. That's an ongoing race. Will the watermark survive a two-stage two LLM process where one writes the first draft 
and a second is asked to revise it with slightly different tone. This may make paraphrasing patterns more consistent in the original sentence generation. Yes, it will survive that because the second one is still generating using those stacks of matrices that I told you about. What about distinguishing humans across languages if, if so many, if so, how many languages? So I think, I mean, in language generation works the same in any language. And English just happens to be the one we have the most for. We haven't done this in other languages, but what I believe 100% is that it's going to work just as well in other languages. Now, what the questioner might have been asking is, if you have someone who's originally a native speaker of some other language, is that going to come through in the text? And I believe that no matter what language they're coming from, human-generated text will be different than LLM text. If I use a large language model of text that, that only I wrote myself to train an LLM, would your tools still be able to differ differentiate? Yes, so an LLM, maybe if it's trained just on you, it still is a regurgitator. It's gonna regurgitate something and um, it doesn't have those nice clean parse trees, those understanding trees behind it. It's that giant stack of matrices and it will be different. How do you think the ability to differentiate AI generated and human written will affect the use of LLMs? If a model like ours or someone else makes a model that's really, really, really good and a lot of people use it, they will simply make LLMs that can get around. So, if a model affects society enough for them to change it, then it loses its effect. So this is a technology we need to be careful with. Great. Uh, thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Uh, Ebony, on the back to Ebony. Well, thank you, Omar. Thank you, presenters. And thank you to the audience. You could have been anywhere else, but you're here with us and we appreciate it. And we're very curious if this event was useful for you. We don't want to just do this just for the heck of it. We want it to be useful. If you've got three seconds to spare, we'd appreciate it if you could fill in your answer to the poll question that just appeared on your screen. Now, I see there are 130 of y'all. So I want to see 130 answers, okay? Okay, we're, we're pumping up. We're pumping up. Okay, y'all are almost there. Why are y'all slowing down? Okay, okay, we're almost there. We got 10 more seconds, y'all. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much to everyone who managed to answer that poll question. Now I'll pass it over to the Center of Excellence's Acquisition Lead, Michelle Petrizen, for our next steps and closing. It was so lovely meeting all of y'all. Thank you, Ebony. So in terms of next steps, we will select the winners by September 5th and post that information along with the recorded presentations online. We are hoping to do more challenges like this in the future, and we can only do that with your help. So like Ebony said, please fill out the survey that's just been posted in the chat. Uh, your feedback makes this event possible and other future events possible. If you haven't joined already, please join the AI Community of Practice, which is hosted by the Centers of Excellence, so you can be the first to register for our next AI challenge. Um, we also have an exciting event series coming in September. The AI Community of Practice has partnered with Stanford University Institute for Human-Centered AI to offer a multidisciplinary education program specifically designed for federal employees ready to learn more about AI and this program will explore the latest in AI developments, equipping federal employees with knowledge needed to think critically about implementing and governing these emerging technologies. There will be six sessions running for two weeks on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays from September 18th through September 29th. And the link to register will be posted in the chat.
Next slide. So finally, there are so many people and teams to thank for today uh, for supporting the creation and execution of this massive event. Thank you to GSA leadership, the Centers of Excellence, the AI Community of Practice, the Presidential Innovation Fellows, and the Communities of Practice support team. I also want to give a special thank you to Ebony for being a phenomenal MC today. We also must express our sincerest gratitude for our keynote speakers and our incredible presenters for sharing their AA technologies with us. And thank you all for logging in, showing up, and helping accelerate IT modernization across the government. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>